So this next um, module or section, as I said, is if you, you know, go from the idea of your construct, your theory, now, you know, get the brass tacks, what rubber hits the road, how do we start designing for dis um, dissemination implementation, for diffusion, um, and how might we think about applying those constructs? My, my talk here is going to be getting you to think through it in a systematic way. Ideally, what you would have next to you is you'd have your framework that you're using. And as you go through this, you're thinking about the constructs on your framework, all right? And that's why we're using the re-aim exercise towards the end, is to practice doing that. But I'm going to walk you through kind of the approach, the steps to go about doing it. I'm taking about 15, 20 minutes to get ourselves oriented. And then what we've brought in are some excellent um, case vignettes from um, local experts here on how they've actually applied their frameworks and thought about the designing and, um, of their various uh, dissemination and implementation interventions. We'll go through each of those and then allow it up for question and answer. So it's to learn from each other what, what's, what are, as, as Russ was saying earlier, are there surprises, are there questions, are there hurdles you've faced? You'd like to use this group to get your feedback because we truly are very fortunate to have some of the national leaders in the field here with us today. So now is the time to ask questions while they're available. Okay? After this, we'll have lunch. So it, this will be about an hour and a half. So think of it that way, too. OK. <laughs> so <laughs> the learning objective is I will be identifying resources for you to think through to help you with your design. And we, through the case vignettes, will be um, presenting information and demonstrating how to think about designing for DNI. Now, the gentleman asked the question, are there any unifying constructs across these various um, 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 uh, theories and frameworks and models and so forth? And so that for me, on a planning mode, this is how I've kind of conceptualized it. Um, you know, for those that have seen the plan, do, check, act cycle, you know, it's kind of analogous to that. This is, um, I, for those that may not know, I used to be in the private sector and how we would design these things in a more pragmatic, applied way. And this would be where you would start. So I'm going to walk you through that thinking um, and just to kind of set the stage. And we'll go through each of these individually. So starting, you know, sometimes we want to jump right in and start designing and implementing and so forth. But it's a good to check yourself, what is the evidence that you're really wanting to disseminate and to implement? And is it worthy of translation? And this is discussion that does happen in national forums. You know, we're all energized to start, you know, boots to the ground. Um, but do we have the right plan? What is the evidence? So how do we look at that? The second one is it, it starts to build a little bit along the line of what Russ was talking about as he was describing the intervention, right? Who is the audience? that you are working with. And I will, as I go through this, get you to think maybe a little bit more broadly as to who's the audience or the target for the change or behavior, what have you. And then who are the related stakeholders that may be secondary audiences or maybe facilitators or could be barriers that you should think about. Um, and once you have an understanding of their um, beliefs, their attitudes, their current habits and practices. Now, how do you start to engage your audience in a way that helps to facilitate the ultimate dissemination and translation? And then the translation phase is what I might call, how do you now start thinking about applying the framework that you have? Right? So as you are, you, you, you're basically doing your homework on the first three steps that set you up in a good way so you can now be prepared to apply the framework towards translation. Um, how do you tailor it, the communication, so it meets the, it speaks to the needs of the audience? How do you now, having done that homework, think about the potential barriers and facilitators? And you can be um, thoughtful in your process of either planning for that or in the evaluation stage thinking of that. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a slide or two on each one of these just to get us grounded. So the first one is the evidence for intervening compelling. Um, and I think there's, you know, where is the evidence on that continuum, if you will, of being demonstrated? 
Um, sometimes the evidence we have is what we call efficacy, or effic you know, it's been shown to be efficacious. You know, the classic sense is you have a new drug, it's been proved in these various rigorous, well-controlled, but narrowly defined populations in these clinical trials. Um, but in essence, efficacy means has, has your intervent or your evidence been shown to work under ideal conditions? Um, then the next level is effectiveness, as it's often defined, is more under real-world conditions. You know, we deal with real patients that have comorbidities, they have um, socioeconomic determinants that are impacting their health, they're in a context, in a setting, we deal with very heterogeneity of the data, of the patients, et cetera. Has the, what you're trying to intervene been shown to be effective in that setting? Or are you the first one that's trying to translate it from the efficacy side to demonstrate it can work in real world? Are you the fifth one that's now working? It's been shown to be effective in certain populations, but now you're working in a specialized population or community or group of people. So it's just thinking through what is the evidence. If you're in a grant side, you would need to say, I'm, I'm not just creating evidence for the sake of disseminating, implementing, but rather there are standards there that I'm taking that as accepted, and now I'm figuring out how to get it out in the real world. So the you know, places to check, uh, as I know you're all are well aware, are what's out there in terms of systematic literature reviews in your field, meta-analyses, what might be published guidelines, both in medical associations or public health, U.S. Preventive Task Force. And, and we're probably all pretty familiar with searching for that kind of information within our own discipline, within our own scientific field. But I wanted to also make you aware of some other resources and sites that try to pull together or synthesize across many of these organizations. One of those activities is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and its Effective Healthcare Program. Um, and out of this come many reports in which they are synthesizing the literature, systematic reviews, and coming up with what does the evidence show for various kinds of treatments. Now, this one I pull here is, you know, management of chronic kidney disease. You know, they will tend to focus on what's the highly prevalent conditions um, and so forth. So it may not actually have what you need, but it's a good place to check to see how are they framing what is evidence that should be um, disseminated. I mentioned this earlier as well as the choosing wisely. So if you are interested in um, what is appropriate use of certain cancer screening or certain diagnostics and so forth. Choosing widely is a foundation that's actually inter, um, interdisciplinary with many, as I said, leading medical associations. And each of those associations have identified what might be their top five focus areas. Um, so if, for instance, they want to make sure um, you know, um, vaccinations or uh, cancer screenings or so forth are being targeted, triaged to the right kind of population. This may be a site where they've pulled together those organizations and it's already synthesized um, consensus statements around that. All right. But the point here is that you should be starting from some evidence that's been shown. Otherwise, you're at a phase of you're still demonstrating effic um, that it's efficacious. Okay, so once you have an idea of your evidence, you know the field that you're working in, whether it be public health oriented or a clinical oriented um, context, it's thinking through very clearly then what is your audience. Now audience comes out of the communication literature largely in which we think of them as the recipient of your communication, right? So an audience in a show, an audience um, is how you think about, you know, who's listening to radio or television, that's an audience for a tape. But it's also who's the recipient of your intervention, okay? So we tend to think of our audience as being patient or public. We tend to think of our audience might be physicians or care providers, right? Um, and these are the ones where we tend to focus our energy. But there's also this sort of group of stakeholders, people who might have a vested interest, and these can be individuals, groups, organizations, and they have an interest or concern in, I say, intervention. But it's the thing that you're trying to disseminate and implement. 
It may not be the group that you're trying to convince to actually do that behavior like a patient, but it could be a group that cares about that in a way that could either help or hinder what you're doing. So the step here is to think you know, systematically, who might these folks be as you're starting to plan? And it, again, it's in the context of your setting. So if you're in a clinic setting, you might be thinking, therefore, the stakeholders in a very, you know, defined uh, clinical population in terms of staff, in terms of the administration. Or you could be thinking about your stakeholders from the context of a population and, you know, really thinking broadly on a community and, you know, politicians and, and businesses in your community all, um, all can be included. This is, um, you know, there are different frameworks. I was involved in the development of this one, so of course you're a little biased in what you develop. But I think it's just, you know, it's not rocket science. It's just being thoughtful. You know, we defined it as seven P's framework um, of identifying who are your stakeholders and just going through and being rigorous, being thoughtful and systematic. You know, which type of patients are you, in, are you really um, focusing on? Which kind of providers? And then, you know, not in the abstract sense, but if you're working in a certain healthcare setting, you would say, I know exactly which provider is the key decision maker in my unit, and I need to make sure that person's on board, that a champion, for example, right? But uh, if you're in healthcare, you might be thinking of purchasers and payers. This is where you start to get government in, you know, so if you're dealing with disadvantaged Individuals, uh, perhaps at a community health center, you know, to what degree are purchasers and payers involved as you're, as you're thinking of your strategies. Policy makers, um, these can be individuals that are establishing a formulary, establishing the protocol within your particular setting. Um, it could be a policy maker for the state as to where the public health priorities are for the state. So, you know, in Colorado, they have 10 winnable battles. Is your intervention area you're interested in part of their 10 winnable battles? Might, how might you involve stakeholder, uh, those stakeholders who are policymakers? And, you know, sometimes I'll jump to principal investigators. We needed another P. But this is really researchers. You know, are there other researchers, funders, you know, your um, program officer that you should be thinking about as well is, is their, their thoughts are around what you're proposing. And I'll conclude with product makers. Now, these would be manufacturers, but the products could be the manufacturer of an electronic health record system, as well as a product if you're trying to do diabetes prevention, perhaps there's um, medicines that are involved, or screening device manufacturers. And I know sometimes, um, you know, in an academic setting, those are, you know, not folks that are often brought to the table. But sometimes if there is win-win situations, um, ideas can be brought that can help facilitate it. Um, I, I, I think of one that comes to mind in which, you know, the beverage industry was trying to, you know, it was in their best interest to take um, sweetened uh, beverages out of schools in the vending machines. Um, they needed to do that um, because it, um, you know, for PR, because it's the right thing for public health, et cetera. Um, and so they actually had a distribu distribution, and they managed the contracts with all of these high schools. And it was because folks like Bill Clinton brought them to the table that they were able actually to get the intervention implemented a lot faster than if probably individuals not working with them had tried to do it on their own. So I just give that out as an example. The main point is to be thinking thoughtfully through this, who are my stakeholders and what do I know about them? So it's doing the homework. And we might call this formative research. But essentially for each group, each consumer or customer of what you're working on, do you have a good understanding of their knowledge, their attitudes, their beliefs, their norms, their motivations? Right? We're all human, and you need to have this understanding in order to understand how to frame your message, how to frame the intervention, so it doesn't add complexity, it's compatible, it's something that's easy to incorporate. And these are principles that come out of diffusion theory that you often, you know, I know there are constructs in CIFR that relate to these as well, but it starts first with understanding what are current habits and practices, norms and beliefs. Um, and sometimes this is in the literature, when people are studying an area, they're investigating, they're doing surveys, they're doing um, 
qualitative ethnographic. Um, sometimes this is in gray literature. If you have a patient foundation, for example, an advocacy group, they often are off out doing surveys, collecting data like this as well. It may not end up in PubMed, but it may end up as a report that they press release or issue. So you may want to also look in the gray literature for this kind of information. It may mean you need to do some of your own formative work before you embark on designing your own intervention. Um, and um, it may mean you need to engage, which brings me to the next um, segment here, which um, is now that you've identified who um, you're working with, how might you engage with them as a partnership in the process? Not as uh, they're my study subjects, and I'm going to do something on that population, but how do I work together? But it's being choiceful here because I, I put down here a couple of references that relate to community um, participatory based research principles. Another one that has framed it in, in health affairs more in the context of um, health care interventions. But you have to, if you are going to involve a, a group to engage with them, you know, are you involving them at the level of consultation, of listening? Are you involving them at the level of involvement that you're going to allow, you know, um, patient preferences to be involved? Or are you truly at a stage of partnership and shared leadership and the level of engagement and energy that you need to invest in that is much higher? And so don't, you know, don't pretend to say you're engaging if all you're asking is a survey. You know, engaging really is developing partnership and that means you have to be open to the possibilities that they might want to reframe your intervention your study question, in fact, that's probably a good sign. It means they're engaged enough that they want to be committed to your end output. So as you listen to some of our speakers talk, they are very, they have wonderful, rich stories uh, along this line, and you should be listening for what they've learned in the process of their own work. I, I call this out um, um, boot camp translation. Sometimes it's helpful when you're writing a grant is to have a reference that you can cite. This is a very nice one that has been developed here locally on campus um, um, with Jack Westfall, with um, his collaboration with communities. And it's a nice description of how they've actually organized around doing this translation. Very practical. You know, they call a meeting together, what they've done with follow-up teleconference calls, emailing. And it gives you a protocol for thinking about how to plan according to that. Um, if you want further information on that, Don Nies, who's now um, leading a, a lot of that effort here on campus, gave a, a seminar uh, last month at our CRISP seminar series, and you can see slides where he walks you through in more detail. Now, at the stage of translation, this is where you, you're using your framework. Um, and I, I borrow from some of the quotes from um, what Ross, uh, Ross had in, in their recent paper this year. Um, and I think, I, I think of these as pearls of wisdom as you embark on applying your framework. Is remembering that dissemination does not occur spontaneously, naturally. Its passive approaches are, are not effective. You've got to be thinking of active interaction um, that's multi-level, multi-source messaging. Um, it's comprehensive. Um, and um, the process of dissemination should be tailored to these various audiences. It might mean that you have to develop different kinds of materials and information, same, same intervention, but it speaks differently to the different audiences in a way that they see the benefit to them. And by, as I said earlier, using the framework increases the likelihood. There are several um, you know, online tools or checklists to help you through this sort of I might call framework-enabled planning tools. We are covering several here today, um, um, and so these will, are available on our site. Um, we're going in many of these in depth that you'll get to hear more of those details. But they're nice tools that are checklists to help guide you. Um, these are other sources for before you reinvent the wheel and create your own dissemination implementation you know, materials, you might want to also check to see if there's already been something that's been developed in, in your area. So ARC maintains an innovations exchange. These are largely successful demonstration projects in various healthcare fields. The CDC also has tools for community action, which are, again, designed to be able to maybe take off the shelf and maybe apply or tweak to your particular setting. 
Um, I'm just going to close here before we move to the speakers with, um, I think social market marketing was mentioned as an early field. I, I have experience in marketing, so I like to refer back to these words of wisdom as well. And, and when you are really thinking of these very large problems around how do you prevent diabetes or prevent cardiovascular disease, you know, it can be somewhat overwhelming. So as you think of your interventions, can you, can you identify audiences or groups that are most ready for action? They're there. They just need a little enabling. They want to do it. Their norms, their beliefs are such that they want to do it. They need some enabling. Um, can you promote single, doable behaviors? Right? A very simple thing for people to do that might have significant impact. Start simple, stay focused. Present the value of your intervention in real benefits in the present. So a lot of what we do in health is preventive, um, and it's hard to imagine why I should do this now when my benefit might be something that happens 20 years from now. How can you make the benefits real today? There's a reason why you see those direct-to-consumer advertising for arthritis drugs, and they're showing people holding grandchildren and being active today. They're trying to take the benefit and make it tangible, right? Um, and and thinking about what might and, and planning for what might be barriers such that you might remove the barriers. And we'll be talking um, further around evaluation, but thinking of the evaluation as tracking results in real time, not just as evaluating at the end of a two-year study, but what can be um, gathered as you go along to make adjustments. And this is where you get the tension between the adaptability, flexibility that you might need versus the fidelity that you might want. Um, and we'll, I'm sure, have more discussion around that. So here are the you know, checklists for action. Thinking about what specifically are you disseminating and implementing? What's the level of evidence? Who are your audiences? Who are the stakeholders? Do you have an understanding such that you can present the value-added benefit of what you're trying to get implemented in a way that's meaningful to the community you're working with and really strategizing around barriers and facilitators? So with that general background, we'll move on to the panelists. We've asked each of them to, tr and it's very hard to do this. We're trying to model what might be a TED-type talk where we're asking people to talk 10 minutes. They could spend a whole day here talking about their research. So we're trying to stay focused on what might be a case vignette example from their field and what might be three nuggets or pearls of wisdom from their own experience that they can pass along to you all. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So we're trying to stay on time. We'll, we'll do the best that we can on that. And, um, and then we'll allow uh, lots of rich discussion at the end. Um, and so I'm really pleased that we have a really excellent set of experts that are going to, and as it turned out, their case examples are somewhat um, complementary to one another. So Arnie um, from Kaiser will be speaking of well child care in a large HMO sect, um, context. Uh, Allie Kemp will be also talking about child care, childhood vaccination with a community health care setting context. So you can see how they might be adapting their interventions differently in those settings. David Goff and Spiro Manson are both speaking about diabetes prevention efforts, but in different settings and different communities. So you can see how they are thinking about their audience their stakeholders, the needs there, and how they may be adapting the evidence for diabetes prevention to those settings. Okay? So with that, um, I will ask Arnie to come up first. Oh, um, and then just to listen for, I think I've covered all of these. Um, I think so. 